So Ontario Shores, uh, we are a 326 inpatient bed teaching hospital. We also provide a, a large a range of outpatient services. We provide a range of specialized assessments for, and treatments for adolescents to seniors. Um, we implemented our electronic health record in 2010 and we successfully achieved a HIMSS level stage seven in 2014. So Ontario Shores, we're a recovery-oriented hospital. Ontario Shores provides individualized assessments for each patient and creates patient-centered care plans. The care plan is an interprofessional tool that is reviewed and regularly updated with the, by the team in collaboration with the patient. The care plan provides an overview of patient recovery and directs patient care. The plan of care has three layers, themes, goals, and assessments and interventions. As part of the Ontario, Shores, Ontario Standard, the Resident Instrument Assessment, or the RAIs, is a mandatory assessment that is done upon admission, quarterly, and discharge. Upon completion of the RAIs, clinical assessment protocols are triggered. The clinical assessment protocols are developed to help clinicians focus on key issues identified during the assessment process. The clinical assessment protocols also help guide the care planning process. We have therefore used these clinical assessment protocols to develop our themes in the care plan. These are a list of the themes that we have. So the clinician can identify areas that the patient may require interventions and add on themes based on the patient needs. So the next layer we have is goals. So there was a maximum of two to three goals per theme. As an Ontario Shore standard, each goal should be reviewed and updated at a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. Because each of our individuals are patients, we have given the clinicians the ability to change this based on their pro patients' needs and progresses towards their goals. Each goal may then also have an attached assessment or intervention. The interventions are used to track progress of the goal and may also have a frequency attached to them based on patient needs. This is what the goal documentation form looks like. So it will ask about if the patient has been involved in, um, in this goal setting. It also allows for the patient to provide their voice in their goal and allows for patient specific details. We also track their progress towards goal achievement um, in collaboration with the patient. We have strengths and barriers and the clinician can use these strengths and barriers to help them achieve their goal. Finally, we have a section for associated clinician in which the most responsible clinician can actually put their name. So this gives the rest of the interprofessional team a point person to go to. Um, and then we also have the action plans, things that are gonna be done to help this patient meet that goal. So we also have what we call a recovery plan. Um, as a recovery-oriented hospital, um, the clinical assessment protocols do not capture recovery, but we wanted to make this as part of the standard of care. Um, we have the recovery plan, which automatically is added on to the patient's chart upon admission. The recovery plan consists of a goal, which is a patient-specific recovery plan, and it has two assessments that are also linked to it. One is a patient story, and the second is a crisis prevention plan. In the patient story, it's all about the patient. It asks about the patient hobbies, work life, or volunteer work, religious and cultural practices, struggles and challenges, future aspirations and hopes, family, friends, and community support. It's a tool to help our Ontario Shores clinicians better know our patients and create a therapeutic relationship to help them promote patient recovery. The second intervention is a crisis prevention plan. The crisis prevention plan is a tool to help patients and clinicians identify what to do during a crisis situation. Questions include antecedents and triggers, de-escalation preferences, early warning signs, and therapeutic interventions. As we have an integrated electronic health record, um, we have the ability to pull some of this information into other areas of the chart. For example, our antecedents and triggers and de-escalation preferences from the crisis prevention plan actually pulls into the patient header. There's a little eye icon with a camera and it actually displays our patient picture, and at the bottom it does display the antecedents and triggers and de-escalation preferences. This way it makes it easier for the clinicians to find that information when required in a timely fashion. So the next couple of slides are gonna talk about how to add on a plan of care item. So as I mentioned earlier, the recovery plan is added automatically upon admission. The status does show up as active. If they want to add additional themes, they could just click on the add button and then they click on themes. This will bring up a list of themes that we have available in Meditech. Clinicians can go through this list and identify what they would like. We also have a little eye information bubble on the far right hand side and if the clinician wants to see what goal is attached to that, they can actually click on that and see more goals that are linked to that. So once a theme is added and they click save, the goals are also automatically added. 
If there is only one goal attached to this plan, uh, theme, it will automatically change the status to active. If there is more than one goal, we have the status as inactive. This gives the clinician the ability to identify which goal needs to be added and change that status. So most of our clinicians, they document from what we call a work list. It lists everything that needs to be done for that day, helps them balance their workload for the day. Um, it produces uh, clocks and frequencies. So we have actually added our care plan items to this as well. You will see little goals are actually on there with the little blue background on the left hand side. And it has a frequency and it shows up as part of their daily work. So this screen is showing you uh, the ability to change statuses. So one a care plan intervention um, is we can change that status to active. We also have the ability to make it inactive based on our patient needs. We also have the, the ability to change that status to complete if there was if that goal has been met. So as an electronic health record, we also uh, our system automatically triggers duplicate interventions. So this screen is showing that there is duplicate interventions and it flags the clinician to know that there are two of the same interventions. Clinician can then change the status to one of one to suppress, so they only have one documentation form. Finally, we have um, reviewing the care plan. So as part of the Ontario Shore standard, a nurse is required to review the plan of care once per shift and as often as possible for allied health professionals. Um, by requiring a plan of care review, this ensures that the clinicians are aware and understand what the goals and the action plans are for the patient and encourages clinicians to take part in helping patients with their recovery. By selecting yes, this verifies that the clinician has reviewed the plan of care and this is logged within the system. Once a patient has been discharged and becomes, part of, becomes an outpatient, the plan of care continues and follows the patient to maintain a continuum of care. Clinicians have access to view the full care plan while the patient is in hospital. The outpatient clinicians also have the ability to print out portions of the care plan and share this with the patient. Next is going to be Stella and she's going to talk about the patient uh, peer support role with the plan of care. Hi, I'm Stella. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of what peer support looks like at Ontario Shores right now. Um, so I'm a peer support specialist and we are consumer survivors that work in the hospital to basically provide, you know, um, related, like compassion through relatability, active listening, and to really be able to understand what the patient's going through since we have been through it ourselves. Um, so at Ontario Shores, we do peer support through doing individual referrals. Um, we run groups like Wellness Recovery Action Plan to help enable the patient to advocate for themselves and make their own goals. And um, we also, you know, do recovery rounds and work with professional practice. Um, so I really like that I'm able to document in the plan of care in Meditech, and I think it's, um, it's a really big advantage because the relationship I have with the patient is... Um, as a peer, and so they often sort of say things to me in a way that they may not say to another clinician, and so I'm able to give them an active voice in their in their goals and in their patient stories, and I think it's a really unique opportunity for me, and it's a unique opportunity for them, because they will actually actively say to me at a point, like, will you put this in my chart? Will you make this a goal for me so other people know about that? And um, I really, um, I really like enjoy my role, and I really enjoy working with the patients because um, I'm able to act as a bridge between some of the clinicians and and the patient as well because I've been on both sides of the clinical practice. So um, I just think that being able to work in Meditech and being able to share, you know, my insights and the patient's insights in the plan of care is just an excellent opportunity. So I thought I'd give you a little overview of social work at our hospital. So social work does pr play a very key role in the provisional of clin provision of clinical services at our hospital. Um, we have approximately 40 social workers at our organization, inpatient and outpatient. In our inpatient units, um, Every patient is attached to a social worker, and so they have a social worker, you know, reviewing their needs, doing psychosocial assessments on them and their families. In our outpatient programs, um, there is social work um, representation in each of those programs. However, in the outpatients, they're seen more as clinicians, so it's they're not chosen based on their uh, discipline role. So some of the um, 
practice at our, at our hospital would be that we conduct psychosocial assessments. So we really look at our patient's uh, family environment, history, um, vocational goals. We look at housing environments that have been supportive and maybe not so supportive of them in the, in the past. We also do um, individual and group therapy with our patients. And we do have a lot of family education that is going on, which I'll speak to um, in future slides. As well, one of our uh, primary roles in the organization at this time is really focused on discharge planning and looking at transitions. So one of the important things that I see about the plan of care um, with regards to social work practice is the importance of case conferencing. Um, case conferencing occurs at multiple points of a person's admission. It might happen at the point of admission, multiple times throughout, and at discharge. Um, I find that at those times, we really do sit around and talk about the plan of care. We go through the plan of care with um, different people, the whole team, as well we invite, as a social worker, I'll invite um, perhaps housing operators, we might involve the family at that point, and they all come to the case conferences to really discuss what is going on with the patient, how we can all best support the patient, and that's also a great way of getting everybody's goals in that plan of care not just our treatment goals and our assessment goals, but also getting on, on the table. What are the patient's goals for transitioning out of hospital, as well as the family's goals while the person is in and transitioning out of hospital? And the plan of care at that point, I feel is a really important piece in exchanging information. You know, we've heard today about how hard it is to sometimes get this in paper document. Well, this way, we can all share around our computer system, what is going on, what are we all doing, and really exchanging that information to everybody who really wants to be there to support the patient, because they're not going to be in hospital forever, that we really need everybody outside who are going to be supporting them in the community, parents, family, house, uh, housing operators, and case managers. We want them to know all this information, too, so that they can continue on supporting the person um, according to what our plan of care even was at that point. Sometimes as soon as a person is discharged, there is no continuing information that does happen into the community. This way, the community is involved at the point of, and during their admissions, during case conferences, that they know what our whole plan of care has been for that person. Um, commonly in our organization, um, you'll see social workers document under the themes of community reintegration. Um, a huge piece is really how we integrate the person back into their community and, and getting them settled during that transitional period. In the outpatient department, social workers will more likely um, document under a theme of illness management as they are clinicians. You know, they are still doing that therapeutic monitoring of their health and wellness. So they continue that into outpatients. And it's hospital wide, but you'll also see us document in the recovery plan. So in involving ourselves in um, the, the patient story, because they also speak to us about um, how things had been in the community before for them, what was what led to their success in the community and maybe was a barrier for them in the community. And it's also our opportunity to really focus on the family piece too. Um, we are often the, the primary point to family involvement in the organization. And so we do get a lot of families coming to the social workers and wanting to have an input into the patient's story too because they have been there along the whole journey um, just as well as our patients have and then the goals that are associated with those themes. So discharge planning, maintaining supports, how do we maintain families' in, uh, involvement with our patients? Sometimes by the time they come to us at a tertiary care organization, families are you know, beginning to burn out or they haven't had the support and they see this as an opportunity to grow themselves. So we really want to ensure the family stays involved or the housing operators and case managers who also might be at their, at their end too, at their breaking. So in managing social life, you'll see social workers wanting to really have the person engage into activities that make them feel well into the community as well as in hospitals. So sometimes our transitional work will be about setting up um, community involvement at a pool or a YMCA. And then management of illness. It goes back to a lot of the outpatient goals as clinicians. And I thought I'd also kind of outline some of the strengths and barriers that I find with the plan of care. I feel that the goals are very holistic. You know, it doesn't focus around just the illness or medication. There are recreational and vocational goals that really do prompt people to consider those, even when, um, say, 
we have a doctor who might ask only about the medication and their illness and their in that way. But really, as a social worker, I want to know about your wellness, not about your, about your illness. So the goals really do prompt clinicians to think about those. I like that it's an interdisciplinary document. So I really can stay on track of what everybody else is doing. When we can't come around the table for a case conference, um, we can all know what each other is doing via the Meditech plan of care. Um, it's used across hospitals, so consistency is huge. If a person transfers to another unit, another program, goes from inpatient to outpatient, there isn't that fiddling for files and sending and trying to find where things were. You can really continue with that plan of care that was happening on another pro in another unit or in outpatients. And I like how it uses a common language. You know, we all have different ways that we might express a goal that might mean something different to me or you, but here we're using the common language that I can really pick up on what you were trying to get at and understand at what you as a clinician was doing and how I might be able to add to that goal. I think it's very timely. It's there at our computers. We have it, at, it's accessible at all times. So whenever I do have an update to do, I can just update it at any time and it doesn't depend on having to meet at, at a team rounds or having to go to a case conference, I can update it because I know the doctor or a nurse will see it at any time that they access it. And just as the nurses access it on a daily basis, we call it a MOPS, an acronym for medications, orders, and plan of care. Clinicians, I've been trying to advocate that all of our social workers also add that as part of their re morning regimen, that they also check the plan of care on a daily basis to review it to ensure what everybody else is doing, they're on board with, they know what the plan is. And then it's flexibility. It really does allow me to, even though the goals might be, and the themes, um, the themes and the goals might be somewhat prescribed, it allows me to expand in, in um, the action plan, what that really means for myself as a clinician and what this really means for a patient or family. And some of the barriers. I left it as a question. Um, is this, if we're doing it around a computer and a computer system, I think we need to sometimes think about when we are coming to a case conference to work with the plan of care, is this the right time to bring up the plan of care? Um, it's become a routine that whenever we do have a case conference, you bring up the plan of care and you discuss the plan of care. I think there's some value in free flow of discussion. And so sometimes when you are involving such a structured um, tool, that sometimes use your own assessment of the family who might be coming in and, and some of the housing operators, is this the time to bring up this plan of care? Can we do this at another meeting? Um, the choices, they are quite limited. Um, they, we have a lot of options, but I think that that can almost be bypassed by the fact that the action plans do allow you that flexibility, but some people in the past have expressed that some of the choices are limited. Um, so in the issue of sometimes it is hard to get everybody together at a case conference to talk about um, patient care and transitions and family work. So sometimes when, especially when there's a crisis situation, I'm sure that a lot of you have known that when crisis comes up, how do we get the information out to everybody? Um, and sometimes in the moment, your thought is not, how am I going to document this crisis? So sometimes in crisis, uh, documenting in the plan of care sometimes gets pushed a little bit further off. And that also speaks to not always update in real time because of that reason. Our crisis situations really do require our full attention and therapeutic thought and assessment before getting to the documentation. But it's better than, um, it is more timely than, than documenting in our paper charts when we used to do it all by hand. I also thought I would take the opportunity to talk about our Family Resource Center. Um, Families have become really f integral to our uh, case conferences and in our plan of cares. In that, we've really noticed that um, families have goals about education and support, and they've been along that journey of recovery. So at Ontario Shores, we have a family resource center that I'm a coordinator of, and it's a, not only a dedicated space for families, because um, units can be intimidating, it's a space for them to come and they can either get one-to-one -one support and education from myself, they might be able to go and connect with other families through me. Um, we do have a very active family council who will do that outreach for families. As well, um, the space is more child-friendly too. So for some of our programs, um, especially maybe forensics, um, it's not the most inviting for children and we do have age restrictions. So it is a space where we can continue patient and family recovery in a setting that is child-friendly. 
So part of the philosophy behind the Family Resource Center is that as much as our uh, patients are on this journey of recovery, so are our families. They have been along this parallel journey of recovery, I would say, that they need the support, education, just as much as our patients. So really, we want to support them not only through the plan of care, but we want to support them in what tends to be a patient-centered um, system and make it more a family and patient-centered system. Um, I know this is a very busy slide, but these are all the services that we provide through the Family Resource Center. So I will co-facilitate family um, wellness recovery action planning groups for families. I will um, have family education nights where we have special presenters come out and really give information to families and give them the opportunity to interact with that profession, professional and ask questions. As well, we have meeting rooms, support groups, we have uh, materials that we've all developed with other family members, um, and family council has been really important in developing and bringing to light the need of families in our organization. And Dr. Fischler. Uh, thanks, Erica. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the role of the physician in the uh, integrated plan of care. So, um, you know, I think back but before I, I joined Ontario Shores, I was a resident and I worked at various different hospitals. And I'm sure at your organizations you've seen is that there's, there are plans of care, uh, integrated interprofessional plans of care at various hospitals, but the degree to which they're used is very inconsistent. Some are, you know, paper-based, written in pencil in a Cardex form. Um, some get printed out from an EMR every three months. Like if you're, I do a lot of work in long-term care facilities. I often see that's the case. So they're fairly static. Um, it's true that they're not always updated perfectly in real time. Our our, our plans of care, but compared to the typical, I think, health organizations, it's, it's pretty close. And, and what's been so important to me as a physician is that it ensures that as a team, we are accountable for the overall patients of care, uh, the overall patient and family's care. It's not just I'm looking after my own aspect of what I think is important and then the social worker and the nurses and um, occupational physiotherapists and, and are, are doing the, are their piece, especially in complex illnesses like severe and persistent mental illness. It's very important that we're all on the same page about what are the various aspects that, that we're providing. So the physicians in, in our plan of care, unfortunately, can't document in it of in, in the care plan themselves, but we can view it. It's very easy to view. And, and typically the plans of care are created in conference situations where the whole team is there discussing what the various roles we're gonna take. And geriatric psychiatry, which is, which is my area, I, I do a lot of treatment for uh, severe behavioral disturbance and dementia, a lot of aggressive behavior. You know, medication is a very, very small part of the, of the treatment. There's a big component of understanding behaviors and their meaning and, and trying different types of interventions interventions, often nursing or social work interventions, to see if they'll alleviate the behavior. So ensuring that we all know who's doing what is extraordinarily important to me to ensure that we're providing the best care possible for our patients. Um, you know, the, the other piece that, that I think is very important too is that there's, if there is a standardized assessment that is built in uh, to our electronic health record system that flows from goals in the care plan, that gets automatically triggered within the uh, EMR so that I can be sure that if we've decided collectively that that's important for our patients is that the nurses will be kind of flagged to do that on a shift-to-shift -shift basis if that's what's indicated and then I can view the results. Um, so I, I see it as, as a way of ensuring that the team as a whole is accountable for the, for the care of the patients and, and that we're not just working as, a, as separate disciplines. So I'm going to pass it back over to uh, Maria who will uh, give you a bit more information. So I'm just going to talk about the plan of care and a nursing practice. So um, we know that nurses are our frontline staff. They tend to see the patient as soon as they get admitted. And a lot of our nurses automatically start the care plan. They start with the recovery plan. They document some of the action plans. They document some of the goals right upon admission. And that may, may, may or may not always be done with the patient. If a patient actually comes in ill and they, you know, um, the staff cannot 
communicate with the patient, they may not always get an accurate care plan until maybe a week later. Um, we do have nurses who provide input from case conferences, so they do use a lot of that information. Our RAIs, which are our resident assessment instrument, they do take information from there in order to develop uh, a care plan for the patient. Finally, we have um, our outpatient clinician. So with an integrated electronic health record, we do all use the same care plan. So both our inpatient staff and our outpatients still use the same care plan. We use the same themes, we use the same goals, and we use the same assessments and interventions. With our outpatients, they have the ability to see that information. They actually can go in and look at what the recovery plan, they can look at the patient's story, they can look at the crisis prevention plan and share that with the patient. They may make modifications to it and they may make additions to it. Um, in addition, they also have the rest of the themes and goals. So they may continue with the theme and goal that the patient has as an inpatient. So it might be medication management, it might be community reintegration, creating supports. Um, so they have that ability to continue on or they have that ability to create a new care plan item and they could just go on, add on the theme, add on the goal and the interventions. Thank you. I think uh, hearing from Regina first thing this morning, and then hearing from Ontario Shores, I was really struck uh, by the emphasis, not only on the patient, but also on families. So kudos to you for that. Um, I know I'm supposed to be asking, uh, starting to ask the questions of the panelists, but I can't help but take this opportunity to ask the audience, by a show of hands, how many people in the audience are currently potentially working with a system like this already, doing this kind of work? Am I missing a hand somewhere? <laughs> no. Okay. I, is anyone doing this in a paper-based way? I see a hand over here. Okay. Great. Thank you. Just uh, quick polling. Okay. I'm going to start the questions off, uh, posing this one to Stella. How has your approach to care planning changed the relationships between clinicians and patients' families at Ontario Shores? Um, I think our approach to care planning has helped sort of bridge a bit of a communication gap between the patient, the patients and the clinicians because what they say gets documented so quickly and um, you know most, mostly, mostly verbatim so people have really have a much better idea of what's going on with the patients with um, the system. Thanks. Can I so, speak too? Yes, please. <laughs> please. Sorry. I will sometimes jump in about the family piece too much, maybe. Perfect. Um, I think that it's been a very important piece that now that the goals are very holistic and with the sort of focus on case conferencing for a plan of care, it has been really changed the focus to involving as many people as possible in those care planning meetings. And so then you do, I think, get a little bit more input into the family focus too. Um, sometimes in this patient-centered type of environment, you might get how, how the patient will be discharged back home. But you would often miss out on what's the family perspective? What does the family understand about their mental illness? What does the family understand about the resource in the community? And really when you have those plan of care meetings, those things are sort of pulled out. You find those things about the family. And so you know that the care then has to also extend to that family for that particular situation. Not all families are involved, but it's really important that when we are around these plan of care meetings, that families then are sort of pulled into some of these conversations and really as a clinician who is often involved with families, I learn those things too from them and I know where some of my focus needs to go. So it's really changed some of the focus and the breadth of care that I know social workers provide our families. Great, thanks for adding that, Erica. Um, I'm going to pose this question to Maria. What have been the biggest challenges that you faced in implementing electronic care planning? So one of the challenges that we had was um, functionality. Um, we didn't want our system to drive our practice and um, we didn't want to implement a care plan because it was working with the system or it wasn't working with the system. So we had to really identify what we needed in our care plan, identify what themes and goals we wanted to use in our care plan and then see how we can actually make that into practice. We wanted to use our Meditech system functionality to the best of our ability and make a lot of automated processes as much as possible but we didn't want the Meditech system to say we cannot continue with a certain practice because it doesn't have that functionality. We wanted to make sure our practice was to the highest standard. 
Great, thank you. That's almost a little bit of a segue into the next a question that I have for you because I, I'm actually gonna pose this to Erica. Mm -hmm. um, how did electronic care planning change your individual or interdisciplinary workflow and processes? Um, individually, as my individual practice, I guess, it has a really, really made me focus on my own efficiency because if I, if now we are working on a system that is readily available to our whole team, we should be updating things more regularly and not waiting for rounds or waiting for those team meetings. It has really focused me into making sure that my, my action plans and my assessments are all up to date. And as professional practice leader, a lot of my focus too is now on, on ensuring that my the other social workers are also doing the same, ensuring that their action plans and their themes and goals in the plan of care are regularly updated so that their whole team can understand what they're doing and, and what they're working on. Um, interdisciplinary wise, it has really um, made me understand the breadth of the work that other clinicians do on my team. I think when we were sort of working in silos or having like these conversations around like a 15, 20 minute conversation around rounds, you don't really understand the, the scope of what other professions do. So I think it's really helped me understand what my, what my fellow colleagues do as well as understand how their work Im impacts my work and how my work can impact their work. And so, um, and when I know what they're working on and why they're working on it, it also leaves opportunity for me to find that person and ask questions about if I don't understand what they're doing or if I think that I might have um, some insights into what they're doing. It gives me that opportunity to really see that concretely Great. on the plan of care. Thanks. Uh, so we did hear that the care plan is shared between inpatients and outpatients, mm -hmm. uh, but I pose this question to Dr. Fischler. Uh, do you have any plans for expanding the sharing of electronic care plans uh, beyond uh, the hospital walls with other health care providers in other sectors like primary care or acute care? Well, I, I think it's, it's a great question. I think the first, um, the first place that we want to share the care plans with is with our patients and their families. Um, so right now, like for example, the crisis plan, which you, you, which you heard as part of our recovery plan, which mm -hmm. is one of the facets of the care plan, we give that to patients. And, and I think it's important for a couple of reasons. One is, what is the use of having a crisis plan if it hasn't been validated by the patient and they don't believe that it's something that they could actually follow through with if they're out in the community without the support of, of the hospital service. So that's the first step. And we do that on paper right now. We can print out our, our care plan, but we also have a, a patient portal at Ontario Shores. And unfortunately, given some of the, um, uh, the, the limitations of functionality of our system, we can't share everything in our, in our electronic health record with patients and, and their SDMs and families, but we're working with our vendor to uh, increase that functionality. And my hope is that, is that care plans are gonna be part of the functionality that will be, be shared with patients and families. So that's, that's, the, that's the first, really, I think, what our, our first goal would be. Um, you know, the, the other major initiative is that across the province in Ontario, there's these health links, which is essentially creating integrated care plans for people with uh, complex uh, um, health conditions, high service uh, users. Um, so I think that there's also an opportunity there to have the our integrated health plans integrate with health link care plans as well. So I'm hoping that's something that we'll also be able to work on in the future. And then the, the third piece is some of the regional uh, EMR infrastructure. Like in Ontario, we have things like Connecting GTA and the other similar um, uh, uh, initiatives that are aimed at uh, liberating uh, clinical information for clinicians across the spectrum to see. So, I mean, our, our care plans are, are electronic and updated in real time. So our hope is that as more gets liberated into these regional initiatives is that our care plans will be there as well. That's really good to hear. Yeah, I mean, right, right now, it's often that our care plans do get printed out and sent to family doctors or sent to a specialist that's going to be taking over the care of a patient or get sent to CCAC when they're providing services in a patient's home. But really what we want to move to is kind of a seamless electronic coordination so that it's not just paper copies that get misfiled or not read quite as often. It's yeah, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to direct this to Stella. 
what do your patients and their families uh, tell you they really like or dislike about electronic care planning? Um, what the patients really like about it is that the like the clinician often comes in with a very whole like big picture of who they are as a whole person. Because I know that as I, when I was a patient, I got very very tired of repeating my story over and over and over and over again with every person that I spoke to. So the clinician can often walk in with a lot of insight, which saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of them repeating themselves, which is frustrating for the patient. So I think that's a really great aspect. Um, I think what they dislike a bit is that they would like to have a little more access, and I think um, that they would like actually like to be able to chart in their own plan of care. Oh, good. Erica, for the family. Um, I think the whole process of being involved more in case conferencing and understanding what is um, going on with their loved one's care has been um, probably their best kudos to the system at this point. Um, they really are being informed about what is each clinician on the team responsible for and what is it that they're doing with their patient and to their patient all those conversations happen in those case conference meetings. And so involving families more into those um, and into the plan, the action planning, it has been really important to where the feedback that I've gotten through the Family Resource Center especially. That's great. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what Stella said too about that uh, patients uh, really requiring access to their plan of care and being able to document directly into their plan of care. It's something that you know, I don't think we see a lot in, in Canada or Ontario, and certainly I think a lot of the uh, vendors haven't created functionality to allow for that, but I think it's something that we should really be, be pushing, because who's the most important partner in determining what, a, what, what what's delivered to a patient? It's really them and their families. And uh, it's not just going to improve the quality of care that's delivered and I think patient satisfaction, but it's also, it has huge wins for clinicians too in terms of efficiency. If patients and families are documenting as part of their uh, care in ways that can be validated, it, it actually saves time for nurses and doctors and other clinicians. Sorry, can I, I'm just going to add to that. We do have a patient story and I did talk about that earlier. Our patient story captures information about um, patients, you know, what they want to do in the future, what are some of their struggles. It's all about the patient. And uh, right now, our nurses and our clinicians actually transcribe that information into the chart because there really is no other way for them to get it into the plan of care. And it is part of their recovery. So that is one of the challenges with our patient portal. We do want to have patient, we want to give patients the ability to document that in their own plan of care so that way it doesn't get lost in translation. Um, clinicians can actually go in and view that. And as some of that information changes, they can go in and update it regularly, again, which adds back to our plan of care. Great. Thank you. That, that's wonderful. Um, Dr. Fischler, I think I'm going to keep you going a little bit on the, a little bit about what you were talking before around organizational benefits uh, of the electronic care planning. What have you found those to be so far? Um, so I, I think the, the biggest benefit is just in, in improving the quality of care uh, that's provided to patients. Um, you know, sometimes I've had an opportunity to do audits, uh, reviews of care that's provided in, in uh, other organizations in my field. And again, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, so a lot of the work I do is providing treatment um, to individuals with severe dementia with significant behavioral disturbance. And having an integrated plan of care is so instrumental in providing the most effective care to patients. So for example, I can give, you know, a, a patient with significant aggression with personal care. You know, we might be trying some pharmacologic interventions to address that, but typically we're also going to try many non-pharmacologic interventions, like we might try using certain types of music when they're receiving care for a period of time. Then we're going to be trying maybe aromatherapy while they're receiving period, uh, uh, care for a period of time. And the plan of care is the, where the, is the place that we can ensure that that's being completed. Mm -hmm and documented and that the various team members that are going to be implementing it are, are held accountable. So from an organizational perspective, not only are they going to see, uh, do we see better um, integrated and comprehensive treatments offered to our patients, is the organizational liability, I believe, is also reduced significantly. If there's ever any questions about what type of care was provided to these patients when they were admitted to your organization, you can go back and you can see who looked at the plan of care? Who documented in the plan of care? How often was all that being done? There's really no question that the organization is meeting its responsibilities and providing proper assessments and and um, and uh, an integration. I, I really see it as the plan of care 
is being it's almost like a, a mini accountable care organization for with just the clinicians on your team right so uh, it's the it's the means for which we can hold each other accountable and the organization can hold us accountable for taking a very comprehensive and integrated approach and ensuring that uh, we're meeting the needs of our patients the other piece too in organizational benefit is an, is an efficiency, especially in, in, in mental health. There's a lot of duplicate, uh, du- there's a lot of overlap in scope of practice actually for, for a lot of us. And a care plan is a place where you can be very clear about who's gonna be doing what. So that three of us aren't all doing the same thing, working at opposite ends, and then none of us are doing something that's very, very important. So in terms of getting the most out of your uh, clinicians, I, I see that as a, a huge organizational benefit as well. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually, uh, given uh, the time, we've probably got about 15 more minutes, so I'm going to watch for a show of hands and maybe ask uh, Shannon and Caitlin uh, to uh, start roaming around with the microphones so that you can pose your que- uh, question up here. And if there's any lull, I have a few more questions that I can ask them, so. I really like what you're doing, and um, the vision and and just the the way you've approached it is quite neat. And I know that sometimes the devil is in the details, and I'm impressed with some of the details you've attended to. And Maria, looking at that little camera icon, that you can look at the de-escalation plans and the triggers is brilliant. It's just, it's wonderful in there to see that. And I know that's part of probably the informatics person in you just sort of has all that with all the discrete data. And Erica being able to talk about the um, personalization and the, and the barriers that sometimes the computers have. And um, I, I like, Elan, that where you're going with the, uh, that shared care plan or the shared plan. Um, and, you know, I wonder if you, when you're looking at being able to have electronic, the first step before the electronic part is making sure that all the other EMRs that the family physicians have have standard data entry for accepting that stuff. So, you know, if I get something in paper and I can enter it in into my EMR in standard data fields, that's, that's a first step I think it would be great in there and help keep that silo. But the sort of the little provocative question is for Stella. Um, <laughs> Being that you're the patient and the theme of this and, and building on something that uh, um, Regina had said earlier was that if these are going to be shared, one thing caught my eye and stigma in mental health is, is just so key. Um, how would you feel getting a, a shared plan where the um, progress towards your goal said to be very poor or poor? I just caught that and I sort of went, now, how would you feel as a patient if you saw that in, in, your, in your plan? Um, so it's my little provocative question sort of triggered by Regina out there. Um, as a patient, I would feel badly about that. Um, and I think that you know, the idea of patients having more access to their plans actually makes us more aware of how we speak about them. It makes us more aware that there are people who have feelings who you know, would read their own plan that we should speak to them like, you know, but like, like we would speak to anyone else and like we would speak to colleagues and hold them with an unconditional high regard. We have a question there and then one over here. Back. I'm just curious, unless I misheard you, the one group that doesn't have access to inputting into this is the physicians, is that correct? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. <laughs> that is, um, that's a system functionality. Um, we are, our physicians have access to view it, um, and we do, this is one of the reasons we actually review our care plan during case conferences, um, so the physician can provide input. But um, it just, we've been working with the vendor to try and get physicians access to documents and input into the plan of care. Um, the vendor just doesn't see how that helps, but we've been trying to, we've been working on it to try and get that done. Yeah. I mean, th- th- this, is, this is something we've been working on since pre-implementation. So uh, we've, e- we've even had the CEO of our hospital uh, bring this up with the vendor. It's such an, Im- it's such an important piece of functionality for us that, that physicians can document in the plan of care. You know, I, I think the workaround that we have right now, uh, there are some there's some benefits to it because it really forces the team to have the conversations before anything is entered in the system. 
But in terms of having a common accountability for creating the plan of care, I think it's instrumental that doctors also uh, can, can enter the information. Um, somebody just asked a version question. We're at Meditech 607. Okay. Uh, there's another question right there. Thanks. Hi, I have an informatics question. Um, so just some questions about the process you have for updating your choices, because you said there's limitation in the choices for themes and goals. So what control do you have at Ontario Shores for doing that versus maybe what the vendor can control? And also considering that it was new, how do you update those choices so that they can reflect the needs of the providers in Ontario Shores? So when we actually uh, developed our themes and goals, um, actually in Meditech, it's actually not called themes, it's called problems. And we worked with the vendor to get that changed. We didn't want to use the word problems, for, especially for our mental health clients. So we actually worked with the vendor to get that changed to themes and goals. Um, in terms of creating our themes, we, um, we actually had a list and we actually went back and we looked at our clinical assessment protocols. That's how we developed our themes. And when we actually created an, our new eating disorders unit back in 2014, we actually looked over our goals and we actually realized we had everything in there. We didn't have to make additions. We do have the ability to add on more themes like we did add on the recovery plan, which is not a clinical assessment protocol, but it was part of what we do at Ontario Shores as a recovery-oriented hospital. Um, so we do have the ability to add on more themes. We do change our assessments and interventions that are linked to goals. Um, and we have the capability to, so maybe upgrading some of our tools, um, using newer version codes. So we have an aggressive behavior skill attached to one of the assessments. Um, we have um, the drug of abuse screening attached to some of our assessments. And as those change, we actually do upgrade those, that information. Here? Oh, right here. Hi, I'm Diane Duff, and uh, I'm one of the peer leaders with the CASD Nursing Education Project, looking at integrating health in informatics within curricula across Canada. And I think there's a pharmacy group that's, that's doing a, a fairly similar project. And I guess I was just wondering if you have had any conversations with your educational partners about um, how to integrate students within care planning, um, I, I hesitate to say, but we still have a bad habit of, for all that we talk about health informatics and for all that we talk about interprofessional, you know, teams and care planning, what we end up doing is sending students home to work on individual care plans that they have no real information about that are not accurate. And so I guess I was wondering how could students be integrated, whether it's medical students, nursing students, pharmacy students, into the care planning process, and are they currently onboarded at all into your system of care planning or conference planning? So um, we do have a, a large number of students that do uh, um, come to Ontario Shores. And um, actually, what we did as part of Ontario Shores, so whenever somebody logs on onto Meditech and actually goes into a patient chart, the first page that they're taken to is the plan of care. And our students are set up the exact same way. The first page they're taken to is the plan of care. They have access to review this patient's plan of care. They do have access to see what goals, themes, and interventions are being documented. They might actually also, they are also in, uh, included in case conferences. Again, this is with, in collaboration with the patient and if the patient is inagreeable, um, but they do attend our case conferences and they can provide input, again, with their preceptor or their supervisor to add to the plan of care. And that goes for not just our nurses, but also any of our allied disciplines. I think there was a question right here as well, too. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, first is, um, it was really interesting and really um, interesting to see all of that work living in one place that everyone can at least look at, uh, even if the physicians can't document in it. First question, do you have any um, um, more objective outcome measures since this work has been implemented around reduced length of stay, reduced readmission rates, um, people functioning, functional status in the community, those sorts of things. Um, and my other question would be, does documentation in the care plans replace other documentation? Or is this more documentation? And so progress notes and other sorts of things. So, sorry, the first question was um, around the goals. Um, we actually do have, again, each theme, we have about 
12, 13 themes, and each theme has three to five goals, and it does actually speak to some of that information. And again, in each of the goals, it has a, a detail section, so we can put in more specific details about that goal, because some of the goals are very general, such as health teaching, and we actually put in more details about what kind of health teaching that they want. So clinicians have the ability to document that in collaboration with the patient to add on to their action plan. Um, in terms of this documentation, we want the plan of care to be part of their daily care. This is why we've added it to their work list. It really, everything that they do, our assessments and interventions are actually part of their daily care. So we're just linking that back to the goal. We're saying, look at your assessments and interventions and use that to identify with the patient, have they been progressing towards their goal? So an assessment might be um, looking at their risk of uh, their self-harm scale, right? Looking at their self-harm, seeing if that's increasing or decreasing, and then using that information to update the goal. Um, and Throughout our daily care, we are providing support and you know, making sure the patient attends uh, programs, making sure that they're getting that information that they need. But so then um, the sort of outcomes of the interventions are being documented separately? No, they are part of the goal as well. So the outcome are part of the goal. So in our Meditech functionality, we have um, when they document on a goal, they actually have the ability to add a note, uh, like a soapy note to it. We use SOAPY note formats, and they can actually document their progress towards that goal. Any more details, um, the patient you know, has been working towards this, we want to do this, so they can actually document. That is all part of their daily documentation. And maybe I can add, because yeah, I think you, you asked also about evaluating whether an integrated plan of care has reduced things like length of stay uh, or other clinical outcome measures. So we, we have so much data in our system because everything's in one place. We could look at that. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but it's certainly a goal moving moving forward. Um, I think I think there'd be some really interesting questions to ask about that. Can I just add on about um, the documentation? So the, with the plan of care, it would be we work really hard in professional practice to avoid double documentation. So it is you don't have to document about those action plans elsewhere if it's documented in the plan of care. And the good thing about um, the system that we're working with is that you can easily pull information from one assessment into and recall it into another assessment. So um, for a risk for discharge delay, instead that information can be pulled automatically into our discharge checklist so that now we have two separate assessments and I don't have to fill out the same information in both. I can fill it in for one and it will recall into the next. So that sort of with the system that we have is one of the benefits for not having double document and not having to do more documentation in different places. Great, thank you so much. Um, because of the time, I see that there were a few more hands up. Um, we're going to have to close the questioning, but I would like to let you know that this whole team is going to be here for the rest of the day, so uh, you'll be able to continue to ask your questions of them.